What's up, Hush Puppies? So today we're talking about seven failure fails. So let's jump right into things. I'm not gonna plug my products or talk about my ebook before the video has even started. What kind of monster am I? What kind of monster are you? The Wolverine. First is technical failure. So this is where your technique breaks down and you're forced to stop the set. Now I'm not saying to go beyond technical failure. If your back is rounding in the deadlift and it's getting progressively more rounded and you're like, but the bar is still moving, I should keep going because Jeffrey Verity Schofield says, no, okay, no, no, no. What I am saying is that just because your form breaks down does not really mean that that's failure because you could have your form not break down. If you're hitting technical failure, improve your technique. And I see this all the time. Someone is doing a set and the reps are getting difficult, then their form breaks down and they stop the set because it was beyond technical failure. But you can just let your form not break down. Now I know technical breakdown, your form changing is not always voluntary, but often it is. Usually your form breaks down in order to make the movement easier. Maybe riskier, but often easier. Actually, your back is stronger in a slightly rounded position. I'm not saying it's safer, I'm not saying you should do it, but that's why your back rounds, because you're actually mechanically stronger in that position. Which leads me to number two, cheat reps. Now, cheat reps can either make a set much more challenging and more stimulatory, or conversely, much less challenging and less stimulatory, depending on how it's implemented. So let's say you're doing curls, and as the reps get difficult, as your biceps is starting to approach failure, you're doing strict reps, and the reps are slowing down, you start to cheat. And you cheat so much that you're actually making it easier on the biceps. You might say this is beyond failure training, but you didn't actually get close to failure because you started cheating so early and you cheated so much, it's actually less bicep stimulation. On the other hand, if you're going to failure or close to failure and you're basking in those divinely succulent, challenging reps, and then you cheat just enough, just enough to get that bar moving up to the sticking point and barely past the sticking point, and then you control the eccentric down, and you keep doing this for a few more cheat reps, only cheating just enough to get that bar up, but still have it be very challenging on the biceps, that is gonna be very, very effective. Next, tempo. Now, I'm dead serious about this. I've had people say, because the reps were slowing down, it was beyond failure. So if the reps are slower than 2.5 seconds for the concentric, you are suddenly beyond failure because like that was your limit that you set beforehand. I think RPE capped and using bar speed makes a lot of sense if you're a power lifter in order to mitigate and manage fatigue. But if you're trying to go to failure, getting a three second rep is not failure. In fact, when you're training to failure, actual failure, you will absolutely always see the rep slow down significantly. It'll vary a little bit from person to person and exercise to exercise, but you will always see some type of slowdown. That is part of failure. Number four, I've also heard this one equally ridiculous, is the mind-muscle connection. I've heard this as a justification for why someone actually stopped a set. So the reps were looking fine, no bar speed slowdown at all, and they stopped. And they claimed that set was actually to failure. And, you know, someone backed them up saying, oh, he probably lost the mind-muscle connection. <laughs> it, it sounds ridiculous, I know, but these people actually genuinely believe this. They lost the mind-muscle connection, therefore it was beyond failure. Can you imagine doing squats and you stop after no rep speed slowdown and your training partner was like, what, what the hell, man? I thought you were going to failure. He's like, yeah, that was failure. I just didn't really feel my quads working as much on that last rep. Number five, and this one is super, super common, conflating zero reps in reserve with failure. So let's say you're doing a hard set of 10. You go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The eighth rep is slower. The ninth rep is even slower. The 10th rep, very, very slow, a complete grind. It takes, you know, four, five, six seconds or more to get up. Then you stop the set. That wasn't failure because you didn't fail. 
you succeeded. It's zero reps in reserve because you probably could not have gotten another rep, but it's not failure. So failure is zero reps in reserve, but zero reps in reserve isn't necessarily failure. And I think you might surprise yourself also if you stop a set when you get a tough rep, maybe that was zero reps in reserve. It sure wasn't failure, but maybe you could have gotten one more. Yep. Yep. Maybe you could have gotten two more. Often I think something is like an all out effort and then I just try for one more rep. I'm like, fuck it. Let's just try one more rep. No. Well, do it. Lift. Fuck it. Do it. Lift. And I get it. And it was actually easier than the last rep that I thought might have been my last one. And then I'm like, fuck it, I'll do another rep. And I get another rep. And so what I thought was actually zero reps in reserve was actually two reps in reserve. If you actually just attempt those extra reps. Number six, beyond failure training. Now, I have a whole section on this in my book. This is stuff like drop sets, supersets, partials, forced reps, slow eccentrics, that kind of thing. The idea is that you go to failure and then you keep going by modifying something. You have to modify something because you just hit failure, right? The only issue is when you don't actually hit failure or you don't actually even hit zero reps in reserve. So it gets challenging, it gets tough, and then you're like, oh shit, well, I've got a drop set coming up and you drop the weight early. This kind of defeats the whole purpose because this advanced beyond failure type of thing is done in order to keep close to failure. And if you bitch out, and don't actually train close to failure, this is completely worthless. And I've seen this many, many, many times. You know, someone is doing an exercise, no slowing at all, then they start stripping plates. And I'm like, why? What the? What? What is the point of that? You're getting almost nothing out of that because the point is to stay close to failure. It's to activate those higher threshold motor units through extreme levels of effort. And you're just using it to avoid extreme levels of effort. So if you're using drop sets or supersets in this way, don't even use them at all. Just focus on trying to train close to failure. Number seven, thinking you should only take one set to failure. I've heard this many times. Oh yeah, just like go to failure on the last set. I think context matters immensely. If you're doing squats or deadlifts, you probably shouldn't be failing at all just because the risk to reward, the stimulus to fatigue ratio or whatever, just does not make sense at all. Don't do it. On the other hand, if it's a seated lateral raise, so isolation movement, small amount of muscle mass worked, not stressful on the system at all, extremely low risk of injury, as well as a strength curve where it's most challenging in the top position. So if you fail, you're really only failing this top part rather than the vast majority. I think you should probably take most sets to failure. So stuff like rows, lateral raises, I take all of those, all of those to failure. So I encourage you to examine this rule and realize that maybe there's a little bit more nuance involved and it could range from not doing any sets to failure ah, fuck. to doing all of your sets to failure, depending on the exercise and then on the individual as well. Finally, number eight, I'll throw in a bonus one just to sort of offset the rest of them. You don't need to go to failure to build muscle. And you certainly don't need to go to failure to gain strength either. And so failure might be the difference between gaining muscle and not gaining muscle, but it's certainly not the only factor. Finally, bonus tip number two, numero nine. It has to have an incredible amount of effort. If your effort is not at RPE 10, it's not RPE 10. Okay, I see a lot of people that go to failure and then they just pop off the bench like nothing happens. And that's not actually failure. You have to give not just an honest effort, but as hard of an effort as you can. If you're not pushing as hard as you can, that's not really failure, that's volitional failure. You have to stop the set because you have no other choice. That's failure. And I highly suggest cultivating a mindset of savage, controlled, furiosity in the gym. And first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a lifter. God damn it. My lift has value. That alone will provide tremendous dividends. Bonus tip number three 
don't call not failure failure. If you're not failing, it's not actually failure. <laughs> Pretty simple. That is all for this video. Like the video if you like the video. Share, subscribe, slap around that notification bell icon thingy down below. Definitely grab a copy of my book. Has 200 pages on pretty much everything you need to know in your gym fitness journey. Peace.